Low limitations on towers. Interesting questions. And the answer is yes, they are. But let's look at a typical cooling tower cell. Are flow rates critical? And the answer is yes. And a lot of people ignore this, and I want you to start thinking about it. Is there a max flow through every tower? Yes, there is. And if you get over that, you go on the hot water basin, it's going to start flooding over going on the outside of the tower, which doesn't make a lot of sense. Wasted energy, wasted chemicals. If you've got cold weather and you exceed the capacity of the tower to handle the flow on the max side, it's going to freeze up on you. How about on the low side? Is there a minimum allowable flow on the low side? And the answer is yes. Uh, before recently, most towers, unless you specified it differently, would have turned down 20-25%. In other words, power ton tower, design flow is 1,500 GPM. If you had 20% turn down, that would mean that tower's minimum allowable flow would have been 1,200. If you had 50% turn down, that means the minimum allowable flow on that nominal 1500 GPM tower would be 750 GPM. Now, what we're trying to tell you, you get below that, the towers don't work correctly. You start having issues. What kind of issues would you have? Lower capacity, you can't get the tonnage, you can't evaporate 15 pounds per ton. Fans run on high speed. Wow. Are you telling me if I don't put enough water to the fill of a cooling tower and my fans are going to speed up and run high speed? Yes, because you cannot maintain leaving condenser water temperatures. You can't do it. Operating costs are going to go up if your fans are running high speed. You're going to have more scale, more rock, more maintenance, all bad things. This can easily be handled in your guide specifications if you go ahead and specify that all towers be, uh, be mandatory turn down to 50%. Something called a weir dam, which I'll show you a picture in a minute, helps you do that on a cross flow. But also, ASHRAE 90.1-2010 Energy Code now dictates all cooling towers have to be 50% turned down to meet ASHRAE code. So that's coming your way. So now you're dealing primarily with the older towers that probably don't have that turn down. So we'll put all this together in the flow limitations. Here on the left-hand side shows overflow. That overflow, as you see, the hot decks are just, the water's just going right off the hot decks down the side. What a waste. You've got extra pumping costs, chemical costs, and if you've got cold weather on that tower, it's going to freeze. Right hand side. That's the rear deck. That's in the hot deck itself. We just put a little piece of metal across the top of the hot deck and we dam it up to make sure the face of the tower always has some water on it. That is never a passageway where the air can go dry air through dry field and out the top. We want that air to always have to pass through some moisture somewhere on the face of the fill of that tower to make it keep working. And that weird dam will let you go down to 50%. Pretty easy, easily done. So what's the message here? Here's a cooling tower. Getting ready to operate that you did not put enough water flow, that you under flow the tower. You don't have the required flow rate. You're operating the tower flow-wise down below below the minimum turn down, whatever that number may be. So what happens? Well, you, you've got your fan sitting there trying to maintain 85 degree condenser water with a verbal speed drive. So you're trying to maintain 85 degrees by controlling your fan speed and maintain 85 going back to your condensers. Okay. Now if you don't put enough water into the high decks, to keep, the fire, to keep the field wet, you've got dry air coming in from both sides. You've got a bunch of field sitting there, and a lot of it is not wet because you're too chintzy with the water. Now, if you've got a bunch of field not wet, dry, and some field that's wet, that dry air is going to seek the passage of least resistance through that field. You know, it feels pretty close together. And where it's wet, you've got a fair amount of air resistance because what are you trying to do? You're trying to evaporate 15 pounds, oh, excuse me, a pound of water for every 15,000 BTUs. That's what you're trying to do. But where it's dry, there's very little, well, very little air resistance. So the dry air finds the dry passageways, passes right through the tower. The fan's sucking that dry air right out the top, and it goes away. And what happens? So you condense the water temperature going back to the, to the condensed. Nothing. It's absolute, it cannot maintain 85 degrees. It tells the tower fans to do what? Run faster and faster and faster. These towers have dry air disease. They ain't working too good, guys, come on. 
It's a terrible problem to have, and a lot of people don't even recognize it. What does it look like when you underflow a tower? Right like that. That's what happens. So you get dry and wet, and right in between, you start building up rocks. Look at that. All of that can be solved with a weir dam. That's another picture of a hot deck with a weir dam in it, a picture that said turn down. And all I'm doing there is make sure there's no way, no passages, where the dry air can get through. It might have a little bit coming in, but it's always going to get to a part of the field that's wet, so my tower still operate. What else would it look like? Yeah, I think you kind of got that in flow limitations, and I put dollar bills on this thing. This is still out of the cooling tower in one year. Yeah, one year. One year. You know why? It's expensive. The field collapse. It's got rocks all over it. How come? The flow rate was too low. This particular situation was a hospital. They had three big cooling tower cells. In a winter time, they had one little chiller that needed to run to maintain conditions in the operating suites in a cold weather. Yes, guess how many cooling towers they ran in the winter time with that one little small chill. They ran all three of them. They ran all three of them. They had dry disease going. They just, just were putting rocks all over their towers. That ain't my fault. There is a minimum allowable flow on those towers, and you better pay attention to it, or you're going to be having big bills like this. The next thing they did was they blamed the chemical treatment guy. It ain't their fault. The chemical treatment guy is just going to make it worse. That's all the rocks that are going to come out. You add more rocks in there, it's going to dry out again. All because you didn't have enough minimum flow. I mentioned this ASHRAE 90.1 2010 thing about the pitch of stick turn down. It was an addendum that came out. And as the addendum came out, it got passed. So this shows the addendum, but this has been passed. It's been approved. And it's actually in 90.1 2013. It is also part of 90.1 2010 because it got accepted as a part of, the, part of that code. And you might note in red it says 50% flow churn down ratio is the minimum. So if you specify that your towers be ASHRAE 90.1 2010 compliant, then you're going to get 50% turn down. And I would suggest you go ahead and do that. It's a simple little thing, but you ought to have guy specifications should have it in there. How about condenser water itself? How about looking at the condensers themselves? Is that an issue flow-wise? And the answer is yes. There's a minimum max flow there. If you overflow the condensers, you're going to erode the tubes. Most centrifugal or reciprocated condensers have a max velocity of 8, 8.5, 9 feet per second, somewhere in that ballpark. And if you get it up much beyond those numbers, you do keep them clean but you start eroding the tubes, and they get real thin, and you can really have a mess. Furthermore, why would you waste all that pumping energy? Why would you put all that KW and all the flow something that doesn't want it to begin with? That doesn't make a lot of sense. On the minimum side, is there a minimum flow rate? Yes, there is. Most of your major centrifugal chiller manufacturers today still preach constant flow to the condensers. Let me repeat that. Most of your big-time Major centrifugal chillers and reciprocating chiller manufacturers today still preach that it's more efficient, more economical to have constant flow through the condensers. They say you can't vary the flow, but once you get it running, once you get head pressure under control, you get it up and running, they would suggest you keep constant flow. Go check that out. Not the main brands, but you whatever brand you like, go ask the question. On the minimum flow side, if you get the flow rate too low, the tubes foul quicker. You get more problems. You get higher head pressure, you get unstable operation, you get more scaling or more rocks on the inside because velocity, the higher the velocity, you have to keep it clean. You lower the velocity, those rocks and scales start getting inside the tubes and you lose efficiency. And as your efficiency goes down, your KW goes up. So they're all bad things. So basically, there is a max and a minimum flow. We would suggest you have constant flow at this time until the chiller vendors change their mind. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great day.